An educational comedy. It's not a cause. Not a movement. It's not a social group you can slap a label on to. It's an idea. It's an intention. It's an intuition. A mindset in which reality can be explored. It's a genuine expression. A certain Critical thinking and imagination. To look inward upon ourselves. To better understand the external world around us. And yes, few egos are bound to be bruised. With our silly, strange, politically incorrect, pure time and velvet style of going about things. Real, Real and raw honesty. Which invites you to be you to the fullest. and welcome to yet another edition of Paradigm Shift and Educational Comedy. Um, my friend Max Egan has recently done another um, YouTube show or whatever you want to call it. Um, the title is called The Storm Has Come. And for this uh, PSAC episode, I'm basically kind of retitling that, rebranding that to PSAC 2016. Featuring Max Egan, changing the world by changing ourselves. Because yes, it is true that Max goes into a lot of details about you know the problems in the world and what's been causing them, and how at least on the brighter side of things that these problems are getting so intense to the point that it's really been sparking an awakening process to where people are becoming aware of what's going on and going, man, what can we do to fix this stuff? So that is the positive aspect of that. But um, the main solution for these things is that, you know, it's kind of like uh, what Jesus said, you can't take the speck out of your brother's eye if you got like this big fucking plank sticking out your own, right? This big piece of wood just right up in your face, you know. How are you going to be helpful to anybody else if you can't even help yourself? So, you know, introspection and self-discovery is very important, especially in 2016, this year of discovery. And really kind of, you know, facing our own paradigms without judging ourselves and without shaming ourselves and beating ourselves and by berating ourselves and sabotaging ourselves. And the more we clear out that mess inside of ourselves and we learn to operate as more functional, more compassionate, more empathetic human beings and we stop falling for the age-old scams and we decide to stop becoming poster children for Einstein's definition of insanity and this fucking collective Stockholm Syndrome we've got going on here. Um, that is when, you know, we then start to really change the world for the better by changing ourselves. And of course, this process takes time. So please respect your time and pace. Um, whatever it is it needs to take for you, it needs to take, and that's fine, and it doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. It's okay that it's going to take time, but start that process now. So without further ado, um, here is Max Egan. Oh, one thing real quick. Sorry, I gotta add one more thing. I talked to Max Egan earlier today or yesterday, depending on what time zone you're in, and he said he's going to be pretty busy up until April, but then after then he would love to, you know, get back onto a PSEC episode uh, with us once again and have a conversation with us. Um, he's already been on one episode. He would like to be on another, so hopefully that is something uh, we can look forward to uh, a little bit down the road this year. Now, without further ado, back again. Children by nature are keen, passionate, and curious. What is referred to as laziness is often merely an awakening of sensitivity, 
a psychological inability to submit to certain absurd duties and a natural result of the distorted, unbalanced education given to them. This laziness, which leads to an insuperable reluctance to learn, is contrary to appearances, sometimes proof of intellectual superiority and a condemnation of the teacher. And this week's opening quote comes from Octave Merbo. Welcome to Surviving the Matrix, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Maxwell Egan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again, and I will be your host for the next hour. You know, folks, I wish I could come onto these shows and have good news for you all the time. That would be quite a pleasure to be able to come here and tell you how great everything is in the world and how much progress we're making towards freedom and all that sort of stuff, but it really doesn't seem to ever be that way, unfortunately. We just seem to be heading further and further into slavery. Of course, there are some good things happening in the world here and there. They just don't seem to be happening in Western countries. Well, perhaps some Western countries. We've seen Hungary kicking out the banksters, it seems. They've thrown out the Rothschild banks. They've thrown the International Monetary Fund out, and now they're working on throwing out the Rothschilds. It looks like they may have taken a leaf out of Iceland's book for that one. And in Russia, we've seen that Vladimir Putin has outlawed all GM in any food or in any preparation of food, which is a very good thing as well. It would be great to see this in Western countries, of course, but we're not seeing it in Western countries. In Western countries, we're seeing things like the discovery of 24,000 different chemicals that are being put into bottled water. Isn't that a wonderful thing? We drink bottled water because the tap water is so polluted we can't drink it anymore, and we find that there are 24,000 chemicals that they're putting in there including endocrine disruptors. Isn't that lovely that that's what they're putting in our water, folks? I tell you, we really are being attacked on all fronts, from all levels, in every single aspect of our lives. We are being attacked through our food, through our water, through our air, through the rubbish that they feed us on the television, the electromagnetic soup they've got us swimming in from the digital mobile phone world that everybody's locked into, and it just seems to be never-ending. It's certainly never ending in Australia. There was a man pulled up just the other day. He arrived at the Gold Coast for a holiday with his girlfriend and he was in a hire car. He just left the airport. And while he was pulled up at a red light, it was noticed by a police officer that he had a 13 tattooed on the side of his neck. And so the police thought they would pull him over and strip search him on the side of the road. Four police officers totally searched the car. Very, very abusive to this man. He filmed the incident on his mobile phone and the police told him that he has to stop filming or they would tase him. And then at the end of the incident, when they couldn't find anything to arrest him for, these police were so corrupt that they actually said, we'll make a deal with you. If you delete the footage on your phone, we'll let you go. Otherwise, we'll confiscate your mobile phone for 28 days. Now, how is that, folks? That's just blatant corruption from police who've got nothing better to do than harass people and tell you that you're not allowed to video it and then try to make some sort of a deal with you. They're going to confiscate your phone if you do video their corrupt actions and video their abuse of office, their abuse of power, their terrorism that they just inflicted upon the public. Of course, they're doing so with the full permission of our dear Prime Minister, Malcolm Turdfull, because he's a right-wing fascist. And this is what Australia is turning into, is in fact leading the Western world in absolute corruption, absolute fascism, and the police state that the global psychopathic elite have always wanted. We're really seeing it go forward in leaps and bounds in Australia, ladies and gentlemen. Like I said on the show last week, if you're thinking about holidaying anywhere, I certainly would not make it Australia because you're likely to be harassed by the police as soon as you arrive, simply because they enjoy doing so. But it's okay because it's all being done under the pretext of keeping you safe, of course. This is really what it's come down to, ladies and gentlemen. This is how corrupt it's getting. And if they can get away with it here, and the people of Apothralia don't stand up and do something about it, then I'll tell you right now that it's going to be extrapolated out to all the other countries in the Western world, because that's how they like to do it, ladies and gentlemen. But of course, there is light at the end of the tunnel, ladies and gentlemen, and that light comes in the form of the huge awakening that is happening around the world. And there really is. A great awakening happening. Don't fool yourself that there isn't, because there is. Of course, it's happening for all the wrong reasons. It's happening because the control grid is so in everybody's face now that you really can't help but wake up. But at least it is bringing about an awakening. 
And if we can get a little bit of respect and unity happening in our respective communities, the awakening can be used to great advantage, ladies and gentlemen. But it really does come down to respect and unity, folks. And I think people are beginning to see that now. They are beginning to see that there is no victory in being a lone wolf in this situation. It's time to unite. It's time for us all to put down our stuff and stand up together. People are seeing this. They're seeing now that the system is so in their face that they simply can't combat it on their own. They do need the support of their neighbours. And that's the thing, folks. You know, if you've broken down these barriers with your community and you're friends with your neighbours, if you all know each other, then when one person in your street gets harassed, the rest of the street comes out to see what's going on and they rally to your aid. And that's what we need to do. We've got to understand that the enemy that we're facing here is our own government. It's these people that have created this entire situation, folks, all the hardship in our local areas that we're seeing, plus all of the wars and all the rubbish that they've done around the rest of the world. It's very easy to see where the problem comes from. And when it's looked at in that way, then it becomes easy to see what the solution is. Our problem when looking at this situation, when we're attempting to find solutions, is that we're always looking for remedies that work within the parameters of the system. And sure, we do need to use parts of the system in as much as we need to use the legal fiction against itself. But really, in identifying the problems, all of the problems come from the top. I mean, I've said this so many times, all of the problems come from the politicians, and the politicians are in fact a criminal cabal. These are not reputable, responsible people of conscience. These are not good people who have your best interests at heart. These are not people who are working for the betterment of society. These are people who are working for the benefit of themselves, and that's all they're working for, ladies and gentlemen. They're working for the benefit of themselves and towards the benefit of the banksters that they ultimately work for. You know, we've got to understand that it's a cacistocracy, folks. We're dealing with a criminal cabal here that has maneuvered itself into a position of control and has adopted an air of respectability by wearing suits and presenting themselves as politicians and smiling and offering you rhetoric and saying all the right things but ultimately it needs to be clearly understood that these people are mass murdering psychopaths they're pedophiles they're murderers they're thieves they are the worst type of criminal that we've ever seen on this earth and these are the people that we are dealing with so when attempting to find remedy it's very important to keep that focus in your mind to understand that you are dealing with an utterly ruthless criminal cabal that has the blood of tens of millions of people on their hands and who will stop at nothing to see their agenda pushed forward to its conclusion. And unless you're going to keep that clearly in focus when you're attempting to approach this system or find remedy to the situation that we're facing, then you're not going to get anywhere. You may make a little bit of headway here and there, but ultimately you're not going to get anywhere because you're not prepared to really look at the brutal, blatant truth of the situation that we're in. Political correctness, folks, is most people's problem. Political correctness and cognitive dissidence, you wrap those two together and you have a very, very ineffective response to any control group. And that's been one of our biggest problems. People simply are not prepared to look at things with clear enough eyes and call it as it is. They always like to think that there's some silver lining somewhere. Well, yeah, there is a silver lining, and the silver lining is us becoming empowered ourselves. The silver lining is each individual on this earth discovering their own personal power and choosing to step into it. You know, the people of the West really need to see how they've been played. They really do. And you know, we were given this concept of freedom, this manufactured freedom, that we were given, which was really not freedom at all. It was simply freedom of choice. Choice on which products to buy, choice on which car to drive, choice on which job to get in order to pay to be alive, choice on which face we can put on the coin of our political system, a choice of which politician to vote for. These seeming freedoms that we've had that haven't really been freedom at all. They've simply been freedom of choice within a slavery system. But we latched onto it and we believed we were free and then we went out and we stomped on the rest of the world because we believed that those people were being oppressed because they were not like us because that's what we were told was happening 
who are told that we must go and stomp on any government that is not like us, any government that won't allow the people to be free the way we are. And what is freedom in Western eyes? Well, it's having a good banking system and all of that sort of stuff. It's all of the rubbish that's been fed to us. And we've been played. And we've gone out and we've, under the guise of presenting freedom to the world and under the guise of keeping people safe, we've gone out and we've set up military bases all around the earth. The United States has set up bases in something like 168 countries. And this is empire building, folks. And of course, now it's all done. The United States will be allowed to implode because it wasn't the United States that was important. What was important was the mechanisms of control. What was important was getting a handle on all of the resources and of all the economies all over the world because that way you have control of the world. That's how it's done. And now that it's been done and now that all the resources have been taken care of and all they've really got to do is tidy up a few of the rogue countries around the world who haven't joined into the International Monetary Fund yet, then it becomes a simple thing to depopulate Western countries. You only need enough people in the Western countries to keep the infrastructure running after all. You can keep the cities there so they've got their playground and you can keep them on the treadmill so you've got plenty of people to harvest and plenty of people to run the infrastructure for you. And then you've got the third world as your supply basket and you can just milk the wealth of the third world steal as many children as you want and keep that cesspool going so you've got this ever renewing tide of humanity that's coming for you so you can keep harvesting the people as you need them and that's the way it's all been set up and you think about it folks you know if you were a really rich family and say three or four hundred years ago and you could see how the world was changing you could see how it was becoming smaller how cities were growing the population was growing and how the economic system was controlling everything and again you could see the population growing and you think well eventually we're going to get to a point where everybody's squabbling over little pieces of land and everybody's trying to claw their way to the top of the pile and what we need to do, because we are bankers and we are in a position to control the economic system, we need to introduce a debt-based currency, which will keep everybody else running on the treadmill too fast and keep them too busy to ever really understand what's going on. And we'll be able to consolidate our power. And we can set ourselves up in our big, beautiful houses with our large estate buffer zones around them. And we can funnel all of the world's resources back to ourselves. And at that point, the world simply becomes our playground. And the people will never know how they're being played because over a period of generations, they will become so locked into this economic system, they will never, ever know how they're being controlled, how they're being played, and how all their energy, all their lives, all their time is being harvested by us and that's what they've done and it's been very clever and the system is coming openly online now is what the problem is that's why we're seeing this massive police brutality in all of our countries we are seeing everything they told us nazi germany was only married together with technology into an electronic a digital control grid that will be far far worse than anything anybody could ever have imagined and that's what these people have set up, folks, and that's what they're locking down now. But it is still providing an opportunity for us because now it's in everybody's face. And that means we have the opportunity to actually heal the situation because now we can actually identify the problem. And there's no real debate about what the problem is. People are beginning to understand that the conspiracy theories and the conspiracy theorists that they've been ridiculing for so many years were actually right all along. And sure, it's a pretty scary thing for many people to actually accept the reality of this. But now, as I said, it's in people's face to the extent that, well, it can't really be denied any longer. But again, folks, it does provide an opportunity for us to heal it. And I think people are seeing that as well. And what they're seeing is that, hang on a minute, it's just people that are doing this. It's just employees. It's just because they wrote stuff down on paper. But that doesn't make it law, that doesn't make it just, that doesn't make it right. I mean, anybody can write anything they want down on paper. It doesn't give them the permission to do it. 
and it certainly doesn't give them the permission to destroy the world, destroy the environment and enslave humanity the way they've done simply because they wrote it down on paper. And I think that's the reality that people are beginning to see and it is a pretty stark awakening and a rude awakening to the fact that we're living in a paper-based control grid whereby criminals do what they want because they write it down on paper that it's okay for them to do it and people are beginning to see it for what it is. So it is a rude awakening but it also is a great opportunity because it's a very empowering moment to realize that, hey, it's just people here. That's all that's really going on. That's all I'm really dealing with is just people. So there is no real problem because there's actually billions upon billions of people who are all feeling the same way about this. And the ones who are controlling us number in the very few. It's just that the police have been militarized and they've got all the right gear and the good weapons now. So that should be a bit of a sign for people as well. I mean, why do you think your police need to wear all this stuff to protect themselves against the poor, hapless little public? You've got these giant thugs in right gear and Kevlar and with deadly weapons all over them, and they're doing this to keep you safe? I don't think so, folks. I think people are seeing this as well. They're beginning to wake up and smell the coffee and realize that they've been played. And that we've actually had this massive private army that's been formed around us. And that these police aren't really police at all. They're not there to protect us. In fact, they're more like prison guards. As I said, folks, it's a rude awakening, but people are beginning to see it now. It really is quite a shame that it took this and it had to get this far before people could see the control grid in front of them. But I guess that's just the way it had to go. But there are positive things happening, folks. There is light at the end of the tunnel. People are banding together. As I said last week, we've got 15,000 people signed up to the Full Circle Project now. And that's 15,000 people that are wanting to get active in their own community and form their own action groups and take it to the next level on the ground where they live. And there's also Ken O'Keefe's World Citizen Initiative. And he's got over the funding he needs for that. So I'm expecting to see some pretty fancy legal groundwork done now to establish some legal standing for the initiative he wants to launch. And if that works, folks, it's going to be a game changer as well. So there is a lot of good stuff. There are people out there that are willing to put themselves on the line to make a difference. And really, that's what it's about. That's what this time in history is. You know, it's a time when mankind chooses to make a stand. I really believe that. Well, at least it's a time when we're given the opportunity to make a stand if we choose to do so. And it is my great hope that that is the choice that we will make. It's certainly the choice that I've made, and it's a choice that I made long, long ago. I drew my line in the sand many years ago, folks. In fact, I think there are many, many people who did. And I think there are many more people who are drawing their lines in the sand right now. Don't believe that it isn't happening, folks. Don't believe that there isn't a great awakening happening. As the song says, the revolution will not be televised. And it certainly won't. The media will never tell you what people really feel. The media will never tell you what people are really doing, what they're getting up to. It will never really inform you of what's happening in your community. It will only tell you the information that the government and the media wants you to have. You know, the media has been hugely complicit in promoting this entire slavery system, in promoting all these illegal wars and this entire police state coming online. It's the media that sold the whole thing to the public. But don't believe what they tell you, folks. Don't believe the control grid is all-powerful. Don't believe that there are billions of police out there that want to kill you. They're really outnumbered, folks, really, when you look at it. There's so many of us, and all we need is a little bit of common sense, a little bit of common decency, and a bit of unity for each other. And, of course, that isn't going to come until we learn to respect each other. And we need to understand that all these mechanisms of control and all these strategies that have been put in place to keep us at loggerheads with each other are all fiction. They're all part of the divide and conquer strategy, and it's been very effective. And we need to put it down, folks. We need to put it down now because there is a huge awakening happening, and it's a really wonderful opportunity. But again, the media won't tell you what's going on. They just don't do that. You know, they make you believe that control grid is all-powerful. They make you believe that people are not active. And when they do get active, they just don't tell you about it. I mean, if the media did inform people what was going on in the world, the world would not be in the situation that it's in today. And we wouldn't see the rampant crime that we're seeing in the world today. And when I'm saying rampant crime, I'm not talking about your average garden variety pickpocket or housebreaker or car thief 
I'm talking about the real crime, such as in the UK and probably in other countries as well. I know it's happening in Australia, but in the UK, there are children being kidnapped by police at the rate of one every 20 minutes, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Apparently, there is a big demand for orphans in the UK. A lot of foster parents who are waiting for children, and there's a big demand for them, and there is a high profit margin in trafficking children to new foster parents. And I say trafficking because that is essentially what it is. What's happening is that UK police are confiscating people's children for the most ridiculous of reasons, and they are taking them away, spiriting them away in the night, and taking them and putting them into foster care because it's very profitable for the government to do so. And this is blatant kidnapping by government, folks, and it's using the police to do it. Now, how are we supposed to feel protected as a society when our police are the ones who are kidnapping our children at the rate of one child every 20 minutes? And bear in mind, folks, the Child Protective Services are supposed to step in if a child is in a state of immediate danger. And we're not seeing this with any of these children. We're seeing police concocting the most flimsy of reasons to simply confiscate people's children and give them to someone else for profit. That is exactly what's happening. It's rampant right across the UK. It's also happening in Australia. There are a lot of children who are being confiscated by child services. And look, I'm not saying that everybody who works in child services is bad. There are a lot of people who work in child protective services who are good people who are out to protect children, and there are a lot of children who are in need of child protection, and Child Protective Services does form a useful task, but there are elements within the Child Protective Services that are not acting on behalf of the children at all. There are certain elements within there that are acting on behalf of the government in order to basically steal children and sell them for profit, and this is child trafficking, folks. That's exactly what it is. And when you look at the rampant pedophile rings that are being uncovered that all seem to have connections to government, one really must be concerned for the welfare of these children who are being kidnapped. Because once they disappear from their parents, they kind of just go into a black hole and we never know what happens to these kids again. This is all done, of course, under the pretext of keeping the kids safe from prying eyes and respecting their privacy and all of this sort of rubbish that they cook up and anything they can concoct to prevent people from ever getting to the truth of these situations. But the lid is being blown off this, folks, and we are seeing a huge outcry from a lot of people regarding this. And the really telling part about a lot of these cases in the UK, especially, folks, is that there aren't, in fact, any child protective officers there when the children are being taken. They're simply being taken by police. And if you can't see something irregular going on there, well, I I really don't know what to say. But, I mean, if a child is going to be taken for its own protection, then certainly there would be someone there from Child Protective Services and not just four or five burly police officers. But again, in the face of all of that, we're not seeing anything at all reported about this from the media. The media will only report child abuse when it comes from some member of the public that they can hang out to dry. But it will never come and you'll never see any reporting directed at the people who abuse children on an industrial scale. And the reason that is, is because most of these people are connected to government. And this is rampant right across the Western world, ladies and gentlemen. And again, it's happening because people are in cognitive dissidence about it. People just don't want to look at the truth of the situation and realize what sort of people we're dealing with, what this criminal catastrophe that runs this planet is actually getting up to while people have their blinkers on and aren't looking and for the most part are in a state of Stockholm Syndrome and are literally fawning at the feet of these people and treating them like gods and demigods and royalty and whatever else and these are the people who are enslaving them. That's the problem folks. Most of the world is simply in a state of Stockholm Syndrome and that's an extremely unfortunate situation for mankind to be in. Of course it isn't all of mankind but it certainly can be said for a great many people. But think about that. The government coming and stealing your children. How would you feel if you're a mother? There's a video that someone posted on my Facebook page the other day. And she's a breastfeeding mother. And they came in and took her child. For no reason whatsoever. Just came in and said, oh, well, this isn't a safe environment. So we're taking your child. And there was nothing unsafe about the environment at all. It was just a young couple. I believe one of their parents may have been there as well. 
and it wasn't a rich house, but it certainly wasn't a hovel, and the child was certainly not in any immediate danger. But this is what they do. They go for the lower class people, the poor people. They start picking these people off first, and they discard the poor, discard anybody who doesn't have money, no one who can really get a good lawyer to be able to combat this because let's face it if you're going to go up against the police or government you need a damn good lawyer and they cost a lot of money so they've constructed this entire system whereby we can never find our way through the red tape even if we want to take the government on we've got to do it in the high court you can't go to the high court without a barrister a barrister costs you thousands of dollars an hour so the whole game is rigged everything is rigged and when they're doing things like this stealing people's children and, you know, it's got to that point, you know, what are we doing about it? How can we just stand by and allow this to happen? And it doesn't matter how much money you've got. It doesn't matter what your level on the social ladder is. If you're someone who loves your children, you love your children. You know what it's like to love a child. You know what it's like to be a parent. How can you stand by and see someone, doesn't matter what rung they're on on the social ladder. If you can see someone doing their best to provide a home for their child, regardless of their financial circumstances, doing their best to provide a safe and secure and loving environment for that child, then you know what it would be like to have that child removed from you. You know, it's the most inhumane thing you can possibly do to a woman, to a family, is to take their child from them. I know what it's like, folks. I mean, I was divorced. I know what it was like when my wife left and took my child away. And I couldn't see him. It, it, it tore my heart out. But to do it to both parents, just to come in and say, well, we're going to take your child now and there's nothing you can do about it because we are the legal people you would have to report the crime to and we don't care what you think, we're going to take your child anyway and there's absolutely nothing you can do and there's no one you can report it to and if you make a fuss, we'll tase you, beat you up and put you in a cage. So, so you have a choice of giving us your child or being tased, beaten, possibly killed and put into a cage. And we'll take your child anyway. So you're best just letting us take it. And it'll disappear into a black hole and you'll never see it again. Thanks for letting us in the door. We're your protective services. That is the world of modern Britain. And I think we've reached break time, folks. So I'll leave it there for now and we'll go and have a break. Thanks for joining me on the air today. It's always a pleasure to have your company. And I'll speak to you in a few minutes. Thanks for listening. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So in attempting to understand what's really going on in the world today, it's important to really step back and look at it. And when you do, what you discover is that the world is being restructured. Basically, all societies and all countries are being restructured. As I touched on earlier in the show, imagine if you're a rich family and you set about to control the rest of the world and make it your oyster, essentially turn the world into your playground and basically enslave the rest of the people and do it in such a way that the people would never realise that they were living in an open air prison. Not until it got too late for them to ever be able to really do anything about it. And we're getting to that point now. The population is so large and it's so disconnected from itself. I mean, we've got massive amounts of people. I mean, it's all very well to say we have 7 billion people on the planet and there's only a handful that are controlling us but the 7 billion that are on the planet are very very disunited and the few who are controlling the many are anything but disunited in fact they all work together and they make sure that they do but imagine if you were this family and you get to the position where you've basically got all of the control now and and those sections of earth that you are not yet in control of have been reduced to states of abject poverty and war and starvation and you're in the process of basically eliminating all of the enemies anyway and you really want to restructure the world to suit your own needs well you've got this aristocratic few that have these big mansions and these massive buffer zones of estates all the way around them all scattered across the earth and you've got to look at what would be the most functional sort of a system for them to put in place on the bones of what is already here, of course, that's what they're going to be building it on. I mean, you need some sort of foundation to build your new society. And of course, it will be built on the bones of the old one. So looking at the world today and what it has been, what the structure of the world has been, and looking at where it's going now, what would be the most obvious thing for this 
ruling family or this ruling bloodline or this controlling hand to do from this point. And when looking at this, it's important to put it in perspective and realize this has been a very, very long running plan and they've gone to great lengths to set it up. You know, it's a plan that's been going on for about three or four hundred years at least, the final stages of it, and certain things have happened to humanity in a certain way at a certain time for a certain reason. It's all been a particularly well-constructed series of events and humanity has been played like a fiddle. And it isn't just Western civilizations that have been played, it's all of humanity. And that includes the third world and anybody that these banking cartels have been able to get their teeth into. Like most especially the third world, they've really been played, they've been manipulated almost beyond belief. But then so have the people in the West. Now as I was saying earlier, they've got the world kind of set up now. They've got all the resources that are being funneled back towards them. They've got all the people enslaved to an economic system, and that's been a very, very important step, and a step that actually goes way back to at least 1302, when Pope Boniface created the first express trust, the Unum Sanctum Trust, and the three trusts that were created in the 200 years following that time by the Vatican, which basically took control of everybody's soul. And it was at that point, of course, that the Crown Corporation was formed, and the pirates were created, and the Crown Corporation went about destroying all the shamanistic cultures all around the world that it could because the shaman would be able to identify psychopaths within the community and also shamanistic cultures had no real need for money they just didn't work that way but they had to remove the shaman in order to bring this whole corporate system online that actually goes back around about seven or eight hundred years so we're talking a very very long standing plan but the final stages of it that have been put in place when the banking cartels took over in the late 1700s, well not when they took over, but when they put their plan into effect in the late 1700s, that plan is coming to its final stages now. And that plan has always been about separating the world and homogenizing them. They've managed to separate the first world, the third world, you know, divide it all into these different categories, the first world, the second world, the third world, the fourth world. And so that's kept the nations divided very nicely. And then they've gone about homogenizing all the rest of the world via the tool of multiculturalism. Multiculturalism has been a wolf in sheep's clothing, folks. It hasn't been about sharing cultures at all. It's been about homogenizing the world. I mean, it seemed all very nice and all very fair, and it seemed like we were helping out people from poorer countries, but we never really looked at why the countries were poor in the first place, which was because of the economic system that the West had enslaved them to. Well, that the Vatican had ultimately enslaved them to anyway. And we've kept the West bamboozled by all the trinkets and baubles that they play with, and we've kept the third world in envy of the first world via their desire for all of the baubles and trinkets of the West to play with. Because the people in the third world only see the version of the first world that is shown to them on the television. They don't really know what it's like to live in the first world. They don't really know what the first world has had to suffer. They don't really see the oppression in the first world. They think it's all flash and bizarre and fanciness and this far out society that they see in the movies. They really do think that way, folks. They only know the first world from television and from pictures that they've seen of the first world. In fact, I can give you a reasonably good example of that. I'm in Peru at the moment in the upper Amazon, and there are restaurants in the town that I live in, and you go there and look for Western food because, you know, they've got Westerners coming, so they have Western menus in a lot of these places. And, for example, if you were to order something like a pizza, you will find that there's no tomato paste on the pizza which is a very strange thing to get a pizza without tomato paste on it. But the reason that is, is because the people who are making the pizza, the people who own the restaurant, have only ever seen a photograph of a pizza. They know what it looks like, and they can make it so it looks the way it does in the photograph, but they don't really know what's on the inside. They don't know that there's tomato paste underneath all the vegetables and under the cheese and all that sort of stuff. So that's what you get. And so that's just kind of one example of the fact that many of the people in the third world simply don't know what the first world is really like. They've only seen it from photographs and from movies and from what the television has shown them. But anyway, I'm probably getting a little bit off topic with pizzas and things, but I just wanted to explain to you that a lot of people just don't know what the first world is really like. But getting back on topic, the ruling hand has got the world set up the way they want now. They've got all the resources funneling back to themselves 
They've got the first world bamboozled with baubles and trinkets, and they've got the third world bamboozled by their need and envy of the baubles and trinkets that the first world has, by the misconception that they hold for what the first world is. And now they are consolidating their power. And not only are they consolidating their power, they're also restructuring the world by restructuring the social systems of the world. You've got to understand what these people want to put in place. They have, as I said earlier, their mansions and their buffer zones. They want the world to return to nature, Agenda 21. This is where it's going. And they want to reduce the population to maintain it under 500 million, as they tell you they want to do on the Georgia Guidestones. And this is true, folks. This is what the plan is. And it's interesting, too, because a lot of people support this plan. A lot of people say, oh, that's a good idea. Humanity should be maintained under 500 million because the world is overpopulated and we can't let that happen. But they don't realise that they are the ones that are going to be depopulated. I mean, there's 7 billion people on the world, folks. If we're going to reduce the population to maintain it under 500 million, well, who is it who makes the decisions about who are the ones to be depopulated? Do you think you'll be one of the ones that's chosen to be left behind? I don't think so, not unless you're someone who's willing to work under extremely poor conditions for a very low wage to keep the system going for the elite. If you're not someone like that, then you're going to be stomped on, and that's just the way it is. And look, you might be a hippie who thinks, well, this is great that they want to let the world return to nature and let the earth become a garden again, but don't think you're one of the ones who will be enjoying that garden. You'll be working in one of the factories or working one of the machines or doing what you're told. The garden will be off limits to you. It will only be available to the important people because they are the ones who know how to maintain things. Of course, it's humanity that brought about all the damage, so they can't let ordinary people go in and use the forests and all that sort of stuff. This will be for the elite to use, not for the ordinary people to use. But the elite will be able to go in there and just check things out to make sure everything is being maintained. Of course, they'll probably go in there and do a little bit of hunting as well. And if you go in there and try to complain about it, well, perhaps they'll just put you in there and hunt you as well. After all, who's going to know about it when the place is off limits to all but the elite? So they've managed to set this whole thing up and it's taken them quite a long time, but it's been a very effective mechanism. They've managed to enslave the entire world to debt through the economic system that's run out of London. They've used the war machine of America to go out and stomp on the world and destroy all opposition to their plans. And now they're depopulating the Western world because they only need enough people in the Western world to run the infrastructure for them. They've managed to put in this police state to keep everybody in check. We've seen the police state is just rampant in all of our countries. This isn't being done to protect us, it's being done to keep people in check and make sure everybody's walking between the lines, make sure anybody who is a threat to the government is taken out immediately. This is why they've gone for the bikers in Australia, because the bikers had arms. The bikers were in fact the country's last line of defence against the government, should the government turn to fascism, which is exactly what it's doing, which is why they've targeted the bikers. But of course they've done it with legislation that is so broad that it can be used to target any group of three or more people that happens to band together to become active in any way at all. And I've done this by coining terms such as anti-government extremist and domestic terrorist, which they've used as a term for people such as those who protest coal seam gas wells and coal mines and logging and anything else the government wants to do. So they managed to put the whole mechanism in place. And they've done it under the guise of protecting us from terrorism. That's what this whole global terrorist threat has been all about. That's what this anti-Muslim hysteria, this Islamophobia that the press has been stirring up while telling you not to hate Muslims has been all about. It's all been a very, very cleverly laid and well-played plan. But these people are in control now. They've got their positions of power. They've got their castles that they live in. And they've got the world basically set up the way they want it. So what would be the next move? Well, they don't really need Europe to be the way it is. You can't have all these countries out there exercising their autonomy. So you need to just basically turn Europe into a cesspool, which is what they're doing through this whole manufactured refugee crisis. And you think about it, folks, Europe isn't really playing much of a role on the world stage as far as control goes. I mean, sure, you've got the EU, which is keeping all of those nations in check and it's milking the wealth of countries such as England and Ireland. 
but it's not really a player as far as the control mechanism goes. The United States is a player because it's got the military hardware that's needed to go out and stomp on all of these countries. England is a player because it controls the monetary system. The Vatican's a player because it controls the religious system. And of course, Israel is a major player because it is Israeli influence that are basically destabilizing the entire world and making the whole police state possible. But if you were someone sitting in your castle and you wanted to control the world from this point, well, you don't really need America to be there anymore because you've got the whole global police state come online so you can manipulate it from anywhere in the world, really, because it's really coming online as one global government. You just got to look at the uniforms of the police folks. As I've said many, many times, we've got our police all around the world now wearing the same black Kevlar uniform. This is the global police force. So the, the new world order is already here. It's just consolidating its power. America will stay there as a military machine because that's really all it's needed for. Europe needs to be destabilized and just basically turned into a washing machine for a while so that you can homogenize all of the races and merge them all into one race. You would allow a certain amount of autonomy to stay with the German people because you want the German technology. The technology that comes out of Germany has always been very, very world-class technology. They've led the way in many types of machinery for many years. So you want to keep a handle on that and allow that to continue. You need to have England remain where it is and remain basically the same, just oppress the people a lot, and that's already happening, but you've got the royal family there, so you're not going to see England get into too much difficulty. Of course, I'd depopulate in England, but they're already doing that through the economic system, and that's the way it will be done in most Western countries. It will be done economically. That's another form of depopulation, and that's already well underway in countries like the UK. America will have the population reduced to the point that they just have enough people there to run the war machine and run the refineries and keep the minerals and resources flowing, basically set up the rest of the place as a theme park and turn it all into Disneyland. And at that point, it doesn't really matter which government runs America. It could be China, it could be anyone runs America, as long as it's set up the way they want it set up. It will have some sort of government running it. It will still exist as America, but it just won't be what it is today. And again, we're already seeing that well underway in the United States as well. Australia will be turned into a mine because you can funnel a lot of resources back from Australia. There's a lot of stuff in that country that the people are going to want. And you've got the third world there as your playground. You can harvest as many people from the third world as you want, and it'll take a little while to bring them into the system that you've created. But their envy for the West will bring them into that system anyway before they know what it is. And we're seeing the police in these countries being militarized anyway. I mean, most of the third world is run by paramilitary regimes anyway, so they're kind of used to seeing people walking around with machine guns as it is. So it's not going to be too difficult to bring things online in the third world. And as I said, they'll do so and they'll welcome it simply via the envy that they have for the first world. Because as the first world gets turned into more and more of a police state, it won't be presented to the people in the third world as being that at all. They'll just continue to see what they see on the television and what the movies tell them and what they see in photographs. And it's much more difficult to bring things such as a cashless society online in places like the third world. I mean, places like Peru, there's no way you could introduce a cashless society here because there's too many people living in situations of poverty. There's too many people who come in from the jungle. There's too many people who do business with very, very small amounts of cash. And were they not able to do that, they simply wouldn't be able to do business at all. You're not going to find a lot of these little shops in third world villages and I mean, you see the shops, folks, you've got no idea that this is even a shop. Half of these places just look like a wooden shack with a colourful cloth out the front. You know, some sort of indication that it isn't just a dwelling. And you're not going to find people like this having credit card machines or scanners or anything like that. I mean, they don't even have electricity. So you're not going to be able to introduce a cashless society into the third world for a good many years yet. You need to consolidate power in the first world and just leave the third world as a little bit of a cesspool so you can use it to harvest the resources and harvest the people. Because there is a great many people also harvested from the third world, there's a great deal of slave trading that still goes on in the world that many people in the first world are probably unaware of. And not just from the third world. There's 
slave trading that goes on from a lot of war-torn places. There's a lot of child trafficking that goes on, as I was touching on earlier in the show. A lot of this is even done by governments themselves. But there's also a lot of people trafficking, a lot of trafficking of women into prostitution in places such as Turkey in the Middle East and even in the Third World. There's women who are trafficked to these places from areas such as Ukraine and the Balkans, the war-torn areas of Eastern Europe and Russia, and places where people have been kept in a pretty volatile and extremely difficult situation. Many of these women have answered ads for online jobs or even bogus job agencies, and they've gone abroad to make money for their families. They believe that they are getting jobs as nannies or whatever, and often end up being sold into prostitution in countries that they had no idea they were even going to in the first place. It's a very unfortunate thing, folks, but it's happening right now. And you'll find that there's a lot of human trafficking that comes out of war-torn areas as well, such as Iraq and no doubt Syria and the other places that the United States goes and gets involved in. The human trafficking that goes on in the world, most especially the trafficking of women and children, is one of those taboo topics that people just don't want to talk about. But it's a very, very widespread problem. And there are people in very high places who are participating in this There's been care workers that have gone into places like Ukraine to help people who have discovered military officers and even people working higher up within the care agencies themselves who have been involved in this human trafficking. And this is abuse of the most despicable kind, folks, that is going on in the world today. And happening to the most brutalised and victimised people in the world, people who are really looking for a way out, And women who are often prepared to put their lives on the line and put their lives on hold and put everything on hold to go and make money in a foreign country in order to support their families and they just disappear into a black hole and never seen again. And it's very, very unfortunate. And as I said, many people will not talk about these issues and it's kind of a taboo topic. And that is what causes it to perpetuate. You know, we see so many issues that we do touch on, but there's so many that we don't. And things that are despicable of a sexual nature are usually the things that we just don't want to talk about. We just don't want to open that doorway. It's somewhere we just don't want to go. It's something that disturbs too many people too deeply, I suppose, to really want to look at it. But I think we seriously need to shine the light on these issues, ladies and gentlemen, because otherwise they're never going to be healed. And that's what's needed, folks. The world needs healing. Human race needs healing. But it's not going to happen until people heal themselves because that's really what needs healing is human consciousness. And what needs to be healed is people's inability to see themselves, their inability to see the beauty of themselves. You know, that's where the healing has to happen. You know, ever since I started this show way back in 2008 when I first came on air, I spoke about how if we change what we are internally, how it ripples out to the outer world. You know, all these hippie sayings that we hear of, if you change the inner world, you change the outer world. Well, that works, but you have to apply yourself to it. You know, if you can see the beauty in yourself and you can apply that to the world around you, that's where the healing begins. You know, if we had a society that respected itself and respected the people around us, we wouldn't have this police state come online. It wouldn't be able to come online. We wouldn't have to stop it. And even now, we don't have to stop the police state coming online. All we have to do is know ourselves and step into that and respect those around us in our community and stand as one. And the police state can't come online because suddenly there's no reason for it to come online. You know, the government, the ruling hand, those who control the government, whoever you want to call it, they can only bring this system online if there is a perceived threat that creates the need for a police state to be there. They've done it through this spectre of terrorism and everyone's buying into it through this Islamophobia. Even the alternative media, so many people in the alternative media are buying into it. They're buying into the Islamophobia. Even people in the alternative media, they're not talking about the Illuminati invasion of Europe. They're not talking about the Zionist controlled invasion of Europe. They're not talking about the Kalugi plan. They're talking about the Muslim invasion of Europe. And that's not what it is. Muslims are not your enemy and Muslims aren't invading Europe. Refugees and extremists are being pushed in there by Zionist elements. I guarantee that many of them are mercenaries. 
Many of them are just kids that have got a chip on their shoulder. Of course they have. We've been bombing their countries for the last 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. I mean, how do you expect these people to feel? But the whole thing has been contrived. And if we step into the respect that we should have for ourselves, then instantly we have it for others. That's just the way it works. As soon as you truly see yourself and know yourself, all the barriers break down between you and everybody else and the world changes. And when we're in that state, there is no perceived threat. So what is the government threatening you with? They're only able to get away with it because so many people are buying into this Islamophobia and so many people in the alternative media are pushing it as well. And it's a lie, folks. It's not real. It's not true. The only thing we have to fear is our governments. And the only thing we really have to fear is what will happen if we refuse to step into our power, if we refuse the opportunity to step into our power that this world situation is giving us. And it's handing it to us on a silver platter. And as I've said so many times, there's so many mechanisms in place now that we can use against the system that we just can't see the forest for the trees. Everything is there for us to heal this world if we could just know ourselves enough to actually want to do it and realize that no one's coming to save you there are no leaders coming to save you there's no lone heroes that are going to step up and suddenly save the world this is programming that people have had through all the movies you notice all the movies whenever there's a terribly repressive regime or a terribly repressive situation there's always a lone hero who steps up and saves the day just look at any of them look at any, any action movie at all, there's always a lone hero, especially when it's a movie that is about global domination. There's always a lone hero that saves the day. Look at movies such as Equilibrium, there's a lone hero who saves the day. Look at iRobot, there's a lone hero who saves the day. All these movies have the lone hero who saves the day because it's a program that makes people think that there's a saviour coming. Even from within the community, there's a saviour coming. They don't realise that they are their own saviour, but they have to be prepared to step into their power in order for it to happen. That's the thing that people are missing. You know, they just can't see the forest for the trees. They think that someone is going to save them. They think someone from the alternate community is going to come up with a master plan and suddenly we're all going to be saved. They think they don't have to participate, but they do. And as soon as they do, the world will change. That's the paradox of the whole thing, is that we can be saved really, really quickly, but we have to do it ourselves. And as soon as we stand up to do it, then I'm sure that other people are going to join in. I mean, I've certainly been trying for the last eight years, and a lot of people have joined in. As I said last week, and I think I said this week, we've got 15,000 people signed up to the Full Circle Project now, and that's a very good thing. That's 15,000 people who want to make a difference. So it is happening, ladies and gentlemen. All you have to do is participate, and now's the time that you need to do it. But look, we're getting very close to the end of the show here now, ladies and gentlemen. As I've said a couple of times on recent shows lately, I'm speaking at Anacapulco in Mexico. Actually, next week, I'm going to Acapulco to speak at the Anacapulco Conference. That runs from the 19th to the 17th of February, so I hope to see you there. The gig that I had booked at Brighton Dome in the UK on March 6th has been cancelled, folks. I hope everybody knows that. I did put that out a couple of weeks ago, and I would like you to remember that. It's been cancelled. But I will be speaking at the Maitreya Festival in Victoria on March 11th through to 14th, I think, and also the Free Your Mind Conference in Philadelphia and at AV America in Portland, and they are both in April, so I hope to see you there. That is it for me, folks. I've completely run out of time for this week. Thank you to anybody who's ever made a contribution to the website. I still have no PayPal or no easy way of getting any unless anyone wants to send me Western Union or perhaps make a direct deposit to the foundation. That would be absolutely awesome because things are certainly getting very tight, which is why I'm in a third world country. But that is it for me, folks. I won't be able to do a show for you next week because I will be in Acapulco, but I will try to get one for you the following week and I will look forward to speaking to you then. But please take very good care until you hear from me next, and I'll look forward to speaking to you when I do. In Lakesh, my friends. In Lakesh.